Hi everyone, this is Charles for chess.com and for today's video lecture, I'm going to show you uh, an important theme in the Grand Prix attack where white exchanges on c6 and black has uh, doubled pawns. So let's go ahead and get started. White plays e4, c5, knight c3, knight c6, f4, g6, knight to f3, bishop g7, and now white plays bishop to b5. This is the main position of the Grand Prix. The theoretical move here for black is knight to d4, but the structures that I'm going to show you are the ones where uh, black allows the exchange on c6, giving uh, black doubled pawns. So the positions that will lead to those structures are when white plays a6, where let's say black plays a6, and now white could exchange on c6. This is one structure. Another structure could be when black plays e6, uh, with the intent of playing knight to e7, knight to e6, and knight d4. So white plays bishop takes c6, and giving black the option of capturing with the b or, or d pawn. And the other uh, move for black here is d6, allowing white to exchange on c6 with tempo, and... Um, and well, this is the other example. What I'd like to say is um, a lot of the ideas uh, or most of the op I learned how to play this opening thanks to a lot of the videos by Roman Jinji Hashvili. If at one point you'd like to um, learn the theory behind the opening, I could def I would definitely recommend uh, all his material. I learned an incredible amount of chess thanks to uh, his lectures. So you could find some of them here. And all right, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so this will be the first example that we're going to look at. In this position, black decided to recapture on c6 with the d-pawn. The main problem here for black is that even though he has two bishops, the bishop on c8 is going to have a hard time coming into the game. And we're going to see how what white does is that he basically locks the position down and he makes his knights better than the bishops. So let's see how this game continued. The player with the white pieces is Gajewski the inventor of the Gajewski variation in the Ruy Lopez, and black is probably some 2400 uh, last name Vega. So white just finished playing d3, black castles, and here white goes ahead and plays e5, locking the diagonal for the bishop on g7. Notice before that uh, at no point bishop d4 check or bishop takes knight makes no sense for black, and so this is a perfectly natural way of how the game is going to continue. So what black is going to be doing here is that he's going to be trying to open up the position for his bishops and white is going to try to keep the position closed. So now black plays b6, white continues with knight to e4, bishop a6, and now the next move is uh, pretty simple but also instructive if you uh, are not aware of this theme, and that's the move b3. Because basically it takes control of the c4 square and black can, cannot play c4, which is what he was threatening, trying to open the diagonal for his minor piece. So now black continues with knight to d5. That's something else that should be mentioned here, is that in this structure with the pawn on e6 and the pawn on e5, the knight also has a hard time finding squares. As funny as that may seem, because even though the d5 square is a perfect square, after c4, the knight has to go away and... Uh, Basically, black's minor pieces are controlled by white's pawns. So let's see how the game continues. Knight to e7, bishop b2, knight f5, queen d2. White has completed his development. His minor pieces are better. He has a space advantage. And black's prospects of, ca of counterplay are difficult. b5 hangs the c5 pawn, and f6 critically weakens the e6 square, and at the same time, it doesn't do much because e5 is a strong port for white. Notice that it's defended by the f pawn, by the knight on on f3, and also by the bishop. White will always have the option of playing rook to e1, either rooks, and the position would be, uh, basically the characteristic of the position wouldn't change. Now, white, black makes a move that is really, 
it's difficult to uh, to make sense of, and that's h5. He basically wants to keep uh, g4 uh, from happening, but that uh, critically weakens. It it uh, it does something. It does something that's hard to understand. Basically, in this in this position, Black will want to play at one point when the position is favorable f6. But now f6 is going to be horrible because after an exchange of pawns on f6, the g6 pawn and the e6 pawn are going to be horrible. I mean, are going to be uh, severe weaknesses. So let's see how the game continues. Rook eight to d1. We have uh, White keeps his advantage. Queen e7, h3. And now we see how White's a clear advantage is going to transform. His space advantage and his and his better minor pieces are just going to steamroll uh, on the king side, and that's how the game concludes in less than ten moves. Knight h6, stopping g4. Knight f6, check. King h8, g4. The space advantage is decisive. White has an initiative on the king side. Um, all White has to do here is play f5 and bring the rest of his pieces, and he should be able to win. Knight g8 f5, the sacrifice, uh, as common as it is in most strategically winning positions, there's probably, uh, you know, they're defined by a tactic. And here, this sacrifice is just clearly better for white. Pawn takes f5, queen g5, the queen comes into the attack, and the game will soon be over. Pawn takes, queen h4 check, and mate is unavailable. Uh, white went on to, actually, black resigned here after a night. So, so this was the first example, and we saw how uh, detrimental it was to capture with the d-pawn when the pawn was on e6, and why this structure is actually bad for black. So let's go ahead and see another example. In this following example, we're going to see what happens after black plays the move a6, basically uh, forcing the bishop to forcing white to basically decide what to do with the bishop. So white goes ahead and captures the knight on c6, and white captures with the b-pawn. So in this structure, it's very common to capture with the b-pawn because basically it opens the, uh, the file for the rook on b8, and that uh, complements the bishop on g7 because both minor pieces will attack on the queen side. There are a couple of mistakes with in this structure, or things that could be talked about in this structure or position, basically the move a6 for black uh, is really not a. It's it's hard to say that it's a gain of time, and I will say why. When the bishop, when you, when white captures the bishop for the knight, he does that with tempo, and that's what he intended to do. And what ends up what ends up happening here is that the pawn on a6 will have to eventually be developed again because after a move like a. Uh, because basically the bishop on c8 uh, will need to be developed. And d7 is not a square where we could say that... Um, and d7 will not be the ideal square for the bishop because it basically doesn't have that many diagonals. So what black will probably try to do here is make a move like a5 and bishop to a6. And so the move a5 is, that is, is basically another waste of time for black. So in general, the strategy here for white or the characteristics of the position is that white has two knights, black has two bishops. Black is going to try to open the position and create dynamic chances for his minor pieces. What black is, what white is going to do is that he's going to close down the position so that the bishops don't come into the game, and uh, and that's how white uh, treats uh, this type of structure. So let's see how white continues. These are two. Uh, relatively strong players. The player of the white pieces plays strategically very well, so I would say that both players are around master strength. White plays d3, putting his pawn in white squares. Now black plays d5, trying to open up the position as we already stated. Here, the move that white played was e5, blocking the position. It follows the plan. I do want to say that uh, another move that should be mentioned is the move h3 here because h3 keeps the bishop away uh, from developing to g4, and uh, it just should be mentioned. So let's, just for for the sake of simplicity, let's continue with the game. White played e5, e6, white castles, black plays h5, and here we see white's uh, main plan, which is to target uh, the pawn on c5. He plays knight to a4, and now what black plays queen to e7. 
where it continues with c4. The idea of this move is to fix the weakness on c5. So now the pawn can no longer uh, advance, and after a move like b3, white could play bishop to a3 and basically win the weak pawn on c5. Black continues with bishop to b7. Here we see that this, you know, this, we see the main problem here in the structure for black, and that's that uh, he's really playing without uh, that minor piece. After bishop b7, we see that there are no prospects for the bishop there. Uh, ideally, uh, black would want a pawn on b7. So white continues with b3, knight h6, bishop to a3, knight f5, bishop takes c5, and we see the, uh, how black is basically hopeless. Now, not only has oh, black won the, the weak pawn on c5, but um, he still keeps all the advantages that he previously had. So this was a, a, a simple example as to how you would treat this position. White, white typically plays knight to a4, attacking the c-pawn, and then he fixes the weakness by playing c4. That way the pawn doesn't advance. Remember that the main strategy here is to keep the position closed for the bishops, and then to target the weakness on c5. So let's go ahead and look at another example with that similar structure. This game is between Mark Hebden and John Fedorowicz. They're both grandmasters and they're relatively considered a, a pretty good players. Uh, Fedorowicz is, uh, used to be a very famous uh, grandmaster here in the States. Now he's a full-time coach. And Mark Hebden, uh, he's published some pretty uh, noticeable books. Okay, so in this position, Black opted to play d6 instead of a6 or e6. White went ahead and played bishop takes c6. Black captures. And now white continues with d3. The reason why I'm showing this game is because it shows uh, a plan of development for black where he develops his pieces in a, in a unorthodox manner to challenge black center which is really what Black is trying to do. But later on, Black committed some strategical mistakes, which was to allow, uh, which was basically to allow Black, White to block the position, eventually leading to a strategically won game for White. So let's go ahead and see what I was talking about. Here Black plays Knight to H6. The idea is to play F5, challenging the center, helping the bishop on C8, and after Knight to F7, uh, having greater control of the e5 square and so at one point white plays e5 the pawn on e5 will be a target and uh it's basically fighting towards opening up uh the center so white went ahead and castled black plays f5 and here white plays queen to e1 uh, a natural move the idea is to bring the queen to the king side but also very important to notice it's um, the queen will later play queen to g3 and it will support the e5 pawn. Black castled, white plays e5, closing the position for the bishops, queen c7, uh, influencing the attack on e5, queen g3, making square for the rook to overprotect the e5 pawn, rook b8, putting the rook on the open file, rook e1. Knight f7, b3. This is how we had expected the game to continue. And now uh, white will play bishop to b2 and later on redeploy the knight and it will protect the e-pawn. So, so far strategically we've seen what we wanted, what, what we knew was going to happen in the position. So let's see how the game continues. Knight to d8, black is rerouting the knight to e6 later to go to e4, to d4. Knight a4, Knight e6, bishop b2, and here black makes a move that basically um, changes the characteristic of the position critically, and that's to play d5. Because now the bishop that's on c8 has absolutely uh, no squares to move to. Notice that the f5 pawn closes the diagonal, um, 
and white is going to play c4 and after bishop to a6 there's absolutely no squares so black is literally playing without a minor piece let's see how white ends up winning this game c4 once again closing the position and also fixing the weakness on c5 rook d8 rook ad1 uh, when when you see a position like this where white has developed naturally uh, it's uh, you, a lot of times you could appreciate white's advantage so bishop to a6 bishop c1 I, I would say that the idea of bishop to c1 is to overprotect the the f pawn so that the queen has uh, so that the queen could do other things in the position like queen to f2 threatening the c5 pawn so queen a5 bishop d2 queen c7 queen f2 targeting the weakness d4 queen h4 the idea here is to play knight to g5 removing the defender of the c5 pawn and the game will be won bishop f8 h3 uh i guess white did not want to play knight to g5 immediately and he is basically He's doing the other uh, plan that white has here. Once you have the space advantage, you could continue with the initiative on the king side. Notice that it's due to the pawn being on e7, it's hard for the pieces to communicate with the other side of the board, and so any attack there would be winning for white. Queen d7, bishop to a5, threatening the rook, rook d to c8, and after knight to g5, an incredibly strong grandmaster uh, resigned after 24 moves. Notice that the knight will be exchanged and the c5 pawn uh, is basically going to is going to win the game for white. In this final example, we see a game between Vasily Ivanchuk and Nidich. Uh, both players are probably top thirty in the world, and the reason why I show this example is because even though it's a, it's a blitz game, we see elite players. We see how elite players treat this position, and what I like about this example is that out of the opening, both both sides play uh, very simple moves, and we see that the characteristic of the position doesn't change, and White basically uh, wins the game thanks to uh, that, sl that slight advantage that he has without doing much uh, due to the better pawn structure. If you see the whole game, it's a lot easier to appreciate and we're gonna go, I'll go ahead and uh, show you the game. So in, in this example, white also played d6. White continues with capturing on c6. He castles, knight f6, d3. This is a very basic structure. Castles, queen to e1. Now white is trying to basically play queen to h4 and f5 attacking on the king side. Bishop to g4. In this example, we see that the bishop is actually exchanged. And that's something that black wasn't able to do in all the other games I've showed you. But notice how the characteristic of the position is still the same. White's pawn structure is better than black's. And here we could say that this position is really not that inferior for black because he's castled, his only weakness would be the a pawn and he's not going to have uh, a hard time with his minor pieces he will probably play knight to e8 knight c7 knight e6 and knight d4 and the position should be equal but we will see how white treats the position and ends up winning the game knight d7 maybe that was an imprecise move bishop d2 f5 Pawn takes f5, rook takes f5. So after the exchange of pawns, we, we see that the characteristic of the position changed once again. Because prior to this, uh, black only had two pawn islands, and now he has three. This should be enough for white to have uh, an advantage, and now we could say that uh, white could play to win to win the game. He, he'll continue with queen t6 check, followed by rook t1, and uh, the advantages are starting to accumulate. Queen to e6, rook to f7, rook to e1. Notice that black here has no counterplay, and white is the one creating all the threats. 
knight to f8, queen e2, queen d7, knight a4. What's the idea of that move? We're not targeting the c5 pawn. What we're basically trying to do is that we're trying to exchange black's best minor piece for white's worst minor piece. The best minor piece for black here is the bishop on g7. The uh, white's worst minor piece was the bishop on d2. So rook to e8, bishop c3, the exchange occurs. And if we assess the position, we see how white's pawn structure is better than black's. Black is currently not uh, threatening to take the initiative, and he's not creating any threats. So all the moves here for white, uh, you know, all the chances are definitely for the first player. E5, uh, this pawn push definitely, um, once again, changes the structure with the pawns. Knight to E4. Now we see we have a better minor piece in our opponent, king g7, pawn takes, rook takes, rook to f1. Rook takes f3, queen takes f3. Uh, assess the position. You know you could see that white is better because his pieces are better coordinated and he has better uh, a better pawn structure and also his king is safer. Queen e7. Knight to d6. As is typically common in, in chess, when you have the advantage, a lot of times the advantage is transformed with a tactic. The simple tactic is uh, capturing the knight, uh, basically capturing the pawn on d6, and after the queen captures on d6, you could see that white wins by playing queen to f7 check, followed by queen takes knight on f8. So knight e6, knight to c8, uh, once again, that defining tactic, if queen takes knight, then white plays queen to f6, uh, forking the rook on e5, and the king on g7. King g8, knight f6. The game is uh, clearly won for white. I'll go ahead and show you uh, the rest of the moves so that you can see how white uh, won the game. c3, um, taking away... Of the square for the knight, rook takes f1, queen takes f1. So the rest is rather, um, it's really not that important because we've seen how white wins the game. But the conclusion of the game, after knight to g5, it's uh, black cannot prevent checkmate. So with this final example, you, uh, you see um, how even though the position was very simple after a couple of pawn moves the characteristics of the game kept changing and um, we see that white wins the game thanks to his pawn structure so i hope you were able to pick something up from from this lecture on how to play positions where you where white exchanges the bishop for the knight on c6 in the grand prix and you're playing versus the double pawns <laughs>